this is the highlight of our week, and we've had a pretty big darn week. And, uh, but to be able to greet the President and welcome him here again to CSIS uh, and to thank him for giving us this opportunity, it's a, it's a great privilege. Um, thank you, colleagues. I'm delighted all of you would come this morning. It's, uh, it's great to have you here, and I think it's a, a testament to your appreciating how important uh, the role of President Mohai and the government of Botswana is in Washington. And if you'll just indulge me for a second, um, America is going through a pretty angry time. You know, we're, our politics is hard and people are not happy with the government. And frankly, at the core of it is a sense that government isn't working here very well. You know, Katrina undercut you know, this perception that America's government could get things done. And frankly, the difficulties we're having in Iraq adds to that. And so I mention this because we have an opportunity to hear about uh, a man and a government that is getting something done and getting things done very, very well. Um, President Moha, you have a, a global reputation for having tackled one of the hardest problems facing any society and to have found practical solutions that work. And that's statesmanship, frankly, that we need in America. And I am delighted that you can be here as a bit of a role model for us on this very important topic. Not just because uh, HIV AIDS is an important issue. You've pioneered that. You've pioneered solutions for that. You've worked with the private sector. When you reached out and cooperated with the Gates Foundation, the Merkel Foundation Corporation, you know, to get a practical solution, you demonstrated government can be effective. And I think that's a role model we need more of in, in governments and around the world, and we especially need to welcome you here in Washington. So I want to thank you for coming. Let me also um, greet, we have, we have some dignitaries here, and I would like to, first I'd like to welcome uh, General Merafe, who is uh, also the foreign minister. And I love having a general who is able to be successful in foreign policy. I mean, that's, we have not made that successful transition so well in this country, uh, although Colin Powell was a great success. So you are in good company, General. Thank you. Uh, uh, Modise Modise is the permanent secretary in the office of the president. We're delighted uh, that you could be here. Uh, Howard Moffat, who, uh, where's Howard? He, there, thank you. Howard has, of course, been a, a pioneer for years and, uh, in uh, the HIV battle in Botswana and part of the success. And great, great to have you here, Howard. Uh, Ambassador Lacroix, uh, you're doing great things in Washington. And I, if, I, if I say even better things, maybe the foreign minister will give you more money. I, <laughs> uh, we can, well, that, maybe that will work out here. Which, uh, I'll praise you if I can. Uh, Joe Huggins, where's Joe? Uh, he uh, used to, was our ambassador. Joe, welcome. Delighted you could join us this morning. Thank you for being here. So we're, we're here today. Uh, this is a celebration of when government does things well. And we, we highlight that and we welcome the people that make government do good things. Now, I will, I'll tell you, uh, the president is getting ready to reach the end of his tenure. And it is my uh, secret hope that he finds a bit of his future here in Washington. And he uh, did some very pioneering and very important work with the Congress, you know, bringing HIV AIDS uh, awareness to a higher state in Washington. And I think that his leadership on helping us understand Africa would be most welcome. So, President, I hope this is not the last time I can greet you to CSIS, but we're very delighted to welcome you today. Please, I invite you to come to the stage to speak with us today. President. Director of Ceremonies, President of the Center for Strategic International Studies, Mr. John Henry, Dr. Morrison, friends, I am not half as clever as, as those who like me would like you believe. 
but I'm clever enough to avoid controversial issues. So I'm going to talk to you regarding the performance of you, your government in relation only to sub-Saharan Africa. I only pass through the Middle East and elsewhere, and therefore I have no authority to talk about those things. And so I will confine my remarks to Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa at that. My delegation and I are very grateful to the Center for Strategic International Studies for this opportunity to interact with friends. In particular, I wish to recognize the tireless efforts of the CSIS Africa program and its task force on HIV and AIDS in helping us to bring Botswana's problems or challenges to the attention of the U.S. government, the U.S. Congress, and the American people. I also wish to extend my gratitude to all of you at the center for your continued interest in Africa. Most of you in this room would be aware that I'm leaving office in March next year. I would not press you on your sources about that. However, as I move on, as you Americans would say, I wish to take this opportunity to share my thoughts with you on a number of issues as Botswana's friends, as Africa's friends. Botswana is still one of the countries worst affected by HIV AIDS. The impact of the scourge on the economy and the people is both evident and severe. The scale of the epidemic has forced us to divert resources away from regular development projects and programs to the HIV AIDS national response programs, thus making it imperative for us that we look to friends such as America and others for support to combat the scourge and keep the country on a sustainable development course. We are grateful to the U.S. government, believe it or not, because I'm talking about Africa and Botswana. I'm not talking about the Middle East or Asia or Latin America. We are grateful to the United States government the private sector, such as the Gates and Meg Company Foundations, the Harvard AIDS Institute, Bristol Myers Squibb, and others, including the advocacy groups, such as the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and the American people for their support in this regard. The assistance we have received and continue to receive from the United States has helped enhance our capacity to effectively respond to the epidemic. In 2002 or 2002, my government launched and rolled out a universal program to provide antiretroviral therapy freely to all our citizens who needed it a program for the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, PMTCT, is also in place. 32 voluntary counseling and testing centers have been built around the country for free and voluntary testing, which testing is a critical foundation and entry point for other HIV AIDS response programs. All these initiatives and others form part of the overall strategy for prevention, treatment, care and support, the cornerstones of Botswana's national response to HIV and AIDS. These efforts have yielded good results, however modest. Today, over 90,000 patients are receiving treatment under the National ARV program 
out of the national target of about 95,000 by the end of 2007. I am confident that we will have reached or even exceeded this target by far by the end of the year. The prevalence rate among pregnant women has declined from a horrendous 37.4% in 2003 to 32.4% in 2006. A modest decline, but a trend we expect will persist. We also witness a significant progression of the probability of HIV transmission from mother to child from 40% in 1999 to 6% in 2006. This means that at least 94% of newly born babies are likely to be born HIV free, an opportunity to achieve an HIV free Botswana by 2016. In the face of a low mortality rate of about under 10% among those on ARV treatment, these decreases are suggestive of declining incidence rates in the population. The modest successes we have recorded in my country, to which I have just referred, and indeed in many African countries, could not have been achieved without United States support under the President Bush Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief, PEPFA. Launched by President W. Bush in 2003, PEPFA provided the much needed budget support to 15 nations, 12 of them in Africa, in order to improve their public health services, especially to address HIV and AIDS. The fund has, in addition, provided impetus to other donors and major contributors to contribute to international efforts to fight the scourge of HIV AIDS around the world. The quantum of resources under PEPFA, a significant amount from a single source by any standard, has helped translate international consensus into tangible opportunity and hope for millions around the world, and particularly in Africa and the Caribbean. In short, America led by good example this time and made a difference and continues to do so. When we heard the news about President Bush's proposal to double PEPFA to US dollars 30 billion in the year 2009, there was excitement around the globe and especially in the developing world and especially in sub-Saharan Africa and especially in black Africa and black Caribbean. There was renewed hope for the many lives that have come to depend on the goodwill of the American people. We now know that there's still hope for our people the commitment of the American people and their government to fight HIV AIDS is beyond the doubt in this instance. These and other reasons make the reauthorization of PEPFA imperative and urgent. PEPFA is now a critical partner in the historic and heroic battle to save lives. PEPFA has turned the despair into hope. PEPFA has galvanized donor countries and agencies alike to act in concert in the interest of humanity. If the fund is not renewed and replenished, the momentum generated by PEPFA thus far will no doubt be lost and the hope rekindled by the generosity of the American people extinguished. I say this to you that's what I said to the Congressional Committee yesterday. The values that inspired and gave birth to humanitarian actions such as PEPFA have been evident in other U.S. foreign policy initiatives in and around Africa. Remember, I'm an African. Pro-African initiatives 
such as Agboa, the Millennium Challenger account, and PEPFAR are both innovative in nature and unprecedented in scope. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the main beneficiary of this goodwill, U.S. administrations, especially the current one, have helped lift millions out of poverty, created employment, diversified economies, and built hope. Out of PEPFA, the Millennium Development, uh, Challenger, develop, the Millennium Challenger Account, and Agoa. And I would contend that in economic terms, Agoa is the single most important Africa-focused initiative by your government in the last 50 years that has had the greatest impact, economic impact. I wish to take this opportunity, therefore, to express my government's gratitude to the Bush administration for including Botswana in Agoa and for its leadership and courage in regard to PEPFA and the Millennium Challenge account. I mention this because although when Agoa was being discussed, we as Botswana were among the African countries summoned to come and give evidence. When it was finally approved, we were excluded on per capita income grounds. It was said that our per capita income is higher than uh, what was in the, the target countries that were intended. We were disappointed and angry with my friend Bill and, and some of the other congressmen at the time such as Charles Rangel, I felt betrayed, quite frankly. But anyway, we continued to lobby, not only the Congress people, but we were lobbied in the new administration, and some of the few remaining junior Clinton administration officials had agreed with us in our sense of grievance. And so they they helped us uh, lobby the new administration. Uh, the new administration considered and uh, went to Congress and asked them to overlook this little per capita thing. <laughs> so they did. And that is why I say I, I am grateful to your administrations, both the Clinton administration which in, and the Congress for initiating Agoa which has been of the greatest benefits to Sub-Saharan Africa. But as Botswana and as the leader of Botswana at the time, I am particularly grateful to the Bush administration in particular for including us in Agoa. As for PEPFA, we are perhaps the greatest beneficiary, not only as Sub-Saharan Africa, but as Botswana, because we, we were ahead of the others. We, we appealed before everybody else. And we have drawn very substantial amounts and benefited from PEPFA more than our sister republics who were initially hesitant. It's only that now, then they are beginning to say, ah, oh, but Donna, you are cheating, you have uh, drawn so much. I said, why were you sleeping and denying? <laughs> now, of course, there is another one out of which you excluded, again on per capita ground. That's the Millennium Challenge account. So I was lobbying on the hill yesterday, and I lobby administration officials wherever I meet them, and I lobby friends of Botswana wherever I have a chance to do so, as I am doing this morning. <laughs> because then again, we meet all the criteria, every one of the criteria except this per capita income one. So I told the, the Congressional Committee yesterday that they should again overlook this. Because we are friends of the United States. Uh, we in Botswana, we in Sub-Saharan Africa. For instance, we in Botswana are the only country on the, in, in Southern Africa, 
that did sign the undertaking not to take Americans to the International Criminal Court. I don't think any African, black African government is trying to do that, but they did not sign, but we have signed, and therefore we were blasted by the opposition in our country and, and the newspapers. They say, well, we are lakeys of the United States. Anyway, I don't know whether we are or not. <laughs> But we are only like it when it comes to development, development assistance. Well, we know sweet side our bread is butter. Uh, if you do wrong things, we don't support you. And so, here, as I said, I was expressing my government's gratitude to the U.S. government and the U.S. people for PEPFA, for the Millennium Development Account, and for AGOA. Because these three are very important to sub-Saharan Africa. They are having a real impact on the ground. My government is working tirelessly to ensure that America's pos positive disposition towards Africa and the excellent relations that exist between the United States and Botswana serve as an anchor for enhanced commercial and investment links. Our shared vision of economic freedom and the free market should also help in forging closer economic ties. Since political independence in 1966, Botswana has embarked on efforts to create an enabling environment to attract foreign investment, including foreign direct investment to promote economic growth and diversify the economy. Deliberate government policies were put in place to create a stable political and macroeconomic environment based on predictable policies to protect property and non-expropriation of investors' assets, to respect the rule of law, to guarantee the sanctity of contracts to ensure repatriation of profits, to promote open dialogue with the private sector. What does this stick together and break the flow of my speech? <laughs> anyway, I wish to use this opportunity, therefore, to call on corporate America to continue to explore investment opportunities in Botswana invest in the stability that the country offers and share in the prosperity and promise of Botswana. The Australians and Canadians have, have come in. The one has opened a gold mine, the other uh, has expanded and opened a copper nickel mine and they are also building a new patented method of refining called the Ativox. Now, of course, it's interesting. The company Line Oil, which is mainly Canadian and Australian, has now been bought by the Russians. So the other day, before I left here, I, I met the executive committee. We said, oh, the Russians are coming. So they said, we are Russians. We have come to pay Kedesiko. But all these Russians were Americans and Canadians and South Africans. <laughs> but anyway, they are Russian now. <laughs> well, as my tenure of office draws to an end, I look back with great satisfaction at my people's success in building and entrenching democratic governance. Over the last 41 years, the people of Botswana, under the leadership of the Botswana Democratic Party, which is my party, and with the cooperation and contribution of the opposition parties, of which there are many, have built a society committed to democracy, the rule of law, respect for human rights, including women's rights, transparency, and good governance. I leave behind to quote a great American statement, a country of laws, not of men. And I feel honored 
to have been part of this tradition and political architecture. I live a party, a country in which institutions and issues are more important than individuals. I'm also confident that these democratic traditions, institutions and laws and not men will not only transcend and survive any pitfalls of political evolution, but will thrive and deepen. The people of Botswana, the architects and visionaries of our political experiment, have preserved and persevered, rather, and succeeded where many have faltered. They can only move forward. They own our democratic culture and deserve the credit. I was privileged to have been a small part of it. I will now take questions from the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for that eloquent speech. Um, what I suggest we do is take uh, a, a variety of comments and questions uh, from the floor. We'll bundle together three or four initially and then come back to the President for a response and then we'll do a second round. So um, please uh, uh, put your hand up and um, identify yourself and try to keep your comments and questions succinct. The floor is open. Joe, would you care to kick things off? Thank you very much, uh, Steve, and, and President Mohai, it's always good to see you. I believe that uh, Botswana serves as a shining light for not only Africa, but the developing world uh, in terms of how uh, democracy and good governance works. And Mr. President, I recall once Tabo and Becky asked you to write a book about how Botswana did it. You declined at that time. I want to ask you again, do you plan on writing a book about Botswana and how Botswana succeeded. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, like to put forward two issues. One is prevention on HIV AIDS. The, as we look forward, uh, as we look forward uh, in the next phase, the next five-year phase, when you look at the countries, particularly in southern Africa where there's been a huge flow of resources for standing up treatment and care as well as prevention. The biggest enduring challenge is to stop new incidents and, re and, and continue to bring rates, HIV rates, down. Uh, and um, uh, many people that work these issues struggle with this question of how to enhance the priority and the effectiveness of prevention efforts because we cannot we cannot treat our way out of this epidemic. And um, I'd, li I'd like to ask you for your thoughts on that. The other issue is the regional uh, uh, challenge and the global, broader global challenge that Zimbabwe presents. And um, I know this is a very sensitive subject for your country. It's one that your country has been very generous in providing a home for over 300,000 Zimbabweans. It's one that you live with in your neighborhood on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's a complex issue for the SADC leadership. It's a complex issue on democratization grounds and human rights ground, and it's one that has broader global implications, as we've seen this week with Gordon Brown, British Prime Minister, announcing uh, very explicitly that he would not attend the EU-Africa summit if President Mugabe is, in fact, invited. We've also had some interesting news in terms of the constitutional developments in the Zimbabwean parliament. If you could offer us some of your thoughts on the nature of the crisis in Zimbabwe and the prospects for finding a way forward in this period that could be both reinforced by the region itself, but also by Washington and London and other governments that have a stake in a stable and democratic and prosperous Southern Africa. Yes, we'll take one other question, right, Sam? And then we'll, we'll come back to Please identify yourself. 
Um, Samuel Odeni Jones from the Department of, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, <clears throat> I want to say, as an African, we're pr proud of your achievements. Uh, <laughs> one of the perplexities of the um, AIDS epidemic is that, in spite of the fact that Botswana was right there at the beginning, did all the right things, you know, so many years later, we're still at around 32 percent, as you mentioned. We've seen just very modest decline. Um, do you have any insights as to what more needs to be done in order to, to, to actually make a, a greater impact? Well, thank you very much for, for the questions. I like that of the ambassador best. <laughs> because it's easier to answer. Yes, I will write a book. <laughs> Steve, I agree that uh, what we have done now, uh, care and treatment, is only phase one. Prevention was always our ultimate objective. That's why we say we wanted zero infections by 2016. Mm -hmm. So we are under no delusion that we are overcoming the, the epidemic. We agree with the light the last speaker, that the decline from 37.4 to 32, it's marginal, 5.2 percentage point. However, the complication, and here now human rights come in, which always have had impact on what we do. Some of the people under antiretroviral therapy who are now feeling well and so on, are having babies. We, when you ask, we say that we don't encourage it, but we dare not say they have no right to reproduce. And so, the complication is that some of the 32 now are in fact people who already are on treatment. The Minister of Health and I go around the country saying, well, uh, we would prefer if you didn't have or babies because even if they are born um, virus-free, the probability by, of their being infected is, is very great when both of you are, 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 are living with the virus. So that's a, another complication. Some people would say, no, why don't we simply say, if you are on, on antiretroviral therapy, you don't reproduce, period. But we can't say that. We are part of the international community. There was a time when I wanted that all the students, especially for tertiary education, especially those wanting to go abroad, should undergo the test more or less compulsorily. Not compulsory, but if they want to go abroad, then they, they should uh, they should uh, undergo uh, the, the test. Uh, because at that time we had a bit of bad problems. We had a few students who had come here, who were HIV positive, then fell ill, and they booked themselves into expensive clinics and would run away from one state to another, and we just had a, a trail of bills coming and so on. What we were told, the U.S. law says we can't withdraw them, we can't do all sorts of things. Some of them ultimately died, and then we had to send them home uh, expensively. Or those who were sent back home, we had to chatter. And we didn't like that. But because we had experience explicitly expressed anger at that phenomenon. 
when I said that uh, maybe all students intending to take tertiary education should test, although we would still give them scholarships, but maybe they would not have been sent abroad. Then they said, ah, no, we think that is a punitive, a punitive measure. That would be a punitive measure and therefore a violation of their human rights. We now have routine testing, whereby if you visit any public health facility, you will be offered uh, a, a, a test for the HIV virus, you, unless you, you, don't, you disagree. But of course, you have to be asked. And at the beginning, a lot of human rights groups Nowadays also, people confuse civil rights with human rights. And people tend to use the word human right when they ought to be using civil right. I mean, if you are inconvenienced for, the, for, for keeping you alive, it seems to me that some of your civil rights could be interfered with a little, but not your human rights. So, that's the the constraints we meet in, as we think of what else could be done. For the present, what we are doing, all the international assistance we are now receiving, most of it now, we are channeling into prevention messages. We are producing plays, we are producing videos, we are addressing meetings, we are holding seminars, and we are inviting people to come up with ideas of what else could be done pursued to, the, to prevention rather than treatment. Because we feel that so far as treatment is concerned, that was the first phase and that has been more or less achieved. I mean the treatment. Uh, but as you say, as all of you say, both you Steve and the other gentlemen, what is required is to enhance uh, prevention. Now, beyond that, I, I don't have any other magic wand to, to wave for, that, for now. But I am thinking, and I want you to help me think, and you too. <laughs> Regarding Zimbabwe, I have said that uh, my main friends here, and I counted you, Steve, Stephen Morrison, among my friends. Why do you ask me about Zimbabwe? <laughs> Zimbabwe is a difficult problem. I often explain that as Botswana, we have done our best, try to talk to our neighbors. We, as a small nation, sandwiched as we are between Zimbabwe and South Africa, we can only lead by precept and example. We can only uh, uh, endeavor to persuade. But we have failed to pers persuade our colleagues in Zimbabwe to talk to each other, to accommodate one another. They believe that all their problems are, are directly caused by their seizure of white land and therefore the imposition of restrictions on their travel by Western Europe and North America. I spoke in Germany, I spoke in Austria, and I reported back to them. I said that the Austrians and the Germans say there are no sanctions on you, Zimbabwean government, President Mugabe. They say that they don't see how travel restrictions in Western Europe and North America on 150 leaders in Zimbabwe, a nation of 16 million, how that can cause 5,000% inflation. But the Zimbabweans agree uh, 
choose not to see anything else except and they take the view and the position if you are not with them you are against them period and therefore it's very difficult to persuade them your government and some of you you say that we don't seem to be applying pressure on them if we made hostile statements against them they would only become more hostile and what purpose will it serve what useful purpose would it serve so we continue to say to them we think that something must give and that it takes two to tango they cannot run the country they are not the only Zimbabweans the opposition are Zimbabweans the newspapers are Zimbabweans and all the other people who have fled the country four million of them are Zimbabweans and ought to be accommodated but uh, we haven't succeeded The next thing is that there has been no consensus among SADC members as to what should be done. As a result of that, we found that if each group insisted on its approach, then SADC would be divided. We choose not to be divided. It's better that SADC continues as a united regional grouping with Zimbabwe as it is rather than be divided between into two groups one pro Zimbabwe as it is one pro for change in Zimbabwe that is our dilemma have I answered thank you we're going to take another round of questions. Again, identify yourself. There are microphones. Um, and uh, uh, please be brief and to the point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Harvey Friedman, and I'm from the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, we've had the pleasure of having a medical care education program in Botswana for about six years now. And I can say from firsthand experience that uh, the progress has been remarkable and I, I suspect that the numbers will continue to come down that there's just this lag phase uh, in, in initiating new programs how long it may take till you start to see the numbers really come down but uh, when President Mohai said uh, are there any other ideas I, I want to remind uh, the audience and President Mohai that I think that his administration and he did one really really important thing for the long term and that is the decision to develop a new medical school in Botswana and I think with the new medical school and an emphasis on public health that the future in Botswana looks uh, uh, even brighter than, than what we've heard today so my, my, my comment is congratulations on that um, and uh, my, my question is, um, do you see the medical school as brightly perhaps as I do for the future of the country? Thank you. Let's take a couple of other comments and questions. Uh, Whitney, Whitney Schneidman here uh, in the front, front row on the left side and then followed by the gentleman in the back next to Will. Whitney. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Whitney Schneidman. Mr. President, thank you uh, for your comments this morning and your uh, great friendship between our countries over the last 10 years. <laughs> My question is, is, is directed to one of the uh, uh, agenda items um, still, still uh, outstanding, and that's the U.S. SACU Free Trade Agreement. And I'm interested uh, in your perspective on um, its, its genuine benefit to the region and to uh, Botswana and your thoughts on um, what we need to do to uh, uh, bring it to a successful uh, closure. This is the South African Customs Union? Correct. Yes. Okay. And we'll take one more and then we'll come back to the President. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Sean Garcia. I work with Refugees International here in Washington. Uh, just a follow-up question on Zimbabwe, unfortunately. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, the, with the growing outflows that are expected from Zimbabwe in the, in the upcoming year, 
uh, we've heard growing interest coming out of uh, especially South Africa in looking at a regional solution to this that can uh, manage outflows in a safe and legal manner and that can also start to address some of the humanitarian needs of people leaving the country. Uh, would Botswana be willing to participate in regional discussion on managing this outflow and providing for humanitarian needs or uh, do we need to continue to look at this as a country by country approach? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President. Yes, we see the role of the university in uh, enhancing uh, our, our public health uh, policies because it will be, we have demonstrated, we have made calculations to show that it is cheaper to train health workers at home than abroad. And also that with new arrangement with which we have been discussing with you, Penn State, um, that when the university will be, the medical school will be, be fully operational, all our students studying medicine abroad will have to do internship at home by agreement with, with, the, with these governments. We, we are now busy negotiating that, that they will not allow them to do internship in the countries where they study, they will have to do internship in, in Botswana by arrangement with those universities. So we think that the university is going to have an important role in, in, in that respect. Uh, plus, paramedics will be trained and everybody supervised at, at, at home. It's also cheaper even for the uh, for donor agencies and, and friends like you, like, like Penn State, where you, you can send two or three people, they have a multiplier effect and if they are in Botswana, much more than when we send the three students to Penn State. And therefore that will be possible with un university uh, operational, just as you have been doing. So we see a, a, an important role for the university. Mr. Snyderman, to trade agreement, no, we, th we think that there is globalization. We as a small nation have always believed we are, we run an open economy in an open society. We believe in, in international trade as free as possible and therefore we think we stand to benefit by trading freely with the United States. But we are acutely conscious of the polarization of development effect when you have partners who are, where there are huge imbalances in, in levels of development. You in the sky as here, and uh, that what will tend to happen is that you just uh, throw down everything. It will, it's easier for everything to fall down to us and we will never be able to get anything to you there. So that we are therefore using our endeavors to try to make you acknowledge that and, and, and give some concessions in our relations. But actually that's not the most difficult thing. You seem to be preoccupied by what you call labor standards. You say that if our workers are working in non-conditioned factories, it means that uh, we are using slave labor or toil and you want you to be represented in our trade unions, you want to be represented in our negotiations between us and the trade unions, in spite of the fact that we have signed all the labor conventions which originated here in Western Europe anyway. We think you are being unreasonable on this labor standards thing, which is your preoccupation and irrational preoccupation in my view. So that is what uh, has prevented agreement being reached. It's, it's uh, the labor issues, especially you're wanting to be represented. Why you, you want to be represented, I don't know. But I understand it's not the fault of the government, it's, it's Congress. There is some 
congressional mandate that requires them uh, to do that, uh, I understand. So I told the congressman yesterday that sometimes there are good people, I like them, they are friends of Botswana and Africa, but sometimes they can be very unreasonable. But so that's, that's what is preventing the reaching of agreement between the Southern African Customs Union, not South African anymore, it's Southern African <laughs> Customs Union uh, and, and, and the U.S. But on the whole, we still believe uh, that we'll continue to, uh, to negotiate. We'll continue to negotiate uh, because we think it's a good thing. We think we stand to benefit by uh, an arrangement, uh, uh, a trade arrangement with the United States. Refugees, they are much will depend on the content of the arrangement or of what you have in mind. Uh, dealing with refugees regionally, I don't know how you do it, but we are open. We are open-minded on, on these issues. We would be willing to discuss with you your proposal, and we can only express our views as to whether we would want to deal uh, unilaterally or or, or 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 collectively, depending on what the content of that of the proposal is. Thank you, Mr. President. On the on to follow up on the refugee international um, question, I mean the humanitarian project, the projections of of emergent of demand for emergency feeding within Zimbabwe are fairly um, dire at the moment. Um, the World Food Program estimates are that there are about under there are over 300,000 people currently on emergency feeding inside. Um, Zimbabwe, and those numbers are expected to grow by tenfold between now and February and March. So the humanitarian dimension of what is happening is ex it's, it's expected, and we're going to be looking at this issue much more closely in the coming weeks, it's expected to gallop forward rather rapidly, and, and you will be on the front lines, and, and your government has been extremely generous and strategic in, in the approach that's been taken. Um, I would expect that the United States government, which is already very invested in, in its food relief uh, within the region, including to Zimbabwe, that the United States government will be uh, generous and, and, and forward-leaning in, in, in working with your government and others to try to deal with this human tragedy that is unfolding and the stresses that it's going to put upon neighboring states if you have an accelerated out-migration. I'm not sure that we're going to see that or not. You already have... 3,000 people a week crossing your border uh, illicitly. Uh, whether those numbers multiply or remain constant, it's still an emergency in a, in a way. Um, do you have any thoughts about, you know, are you preparing in your own mind, in your own, within your own government, are you preparing for the, the possibility that within the next six to, to, to eight months that there is going to be a dramatic uptick in the humanitarian demand and what that may mean as that dimension begins to drive things forward. That may, that has the potential to sort of overwhelm some of the other uh, broader discussions. And I'd just like to ask you to, to offer us your thoughts on that. Yes, we are worried about that, 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 that possibility and we would need assistance. Uh, after all, we are in a drought situation ourselves. We have a drought relief program for our own people. and. Um, uh, our problems, our current problems, both the unemployment program, the crime situation, is exacerbated by the inflow of illegal immigrants. And um, we are having a lot of rising resentment by locals, mm -hmm. blaming mm -hmm. illegals for almost everything, even where the illegals are not to blame. We have a problem where these Zimbabweans are exploited by by citizens, including, including Zimbabweans living and working in Botswana. Mm -hmm. They pretend to be giving them relief, giving them jobs, but they, they exploit them. They, they employ them and they don't pay them and the poor illegals have nowhere to go. Because if you try to go to the labor department, they ask you for your work permit, mm -hmm. your residence permit, then uh, instead of helping you, they want to arrest you, to deport you to Zimbabwe. Uh, 
so it is a problem. Yes, we are thinking about it, but we don't have uh, answers. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just one other comment, and then I'd like to invite one last round of questions, uh, which was triggered by Har Harvey Friedman's comment from the University of Pennsylvania and from the medical school. We're at a point now where the partnerships that, that, that Howard and others have created with American medical biomedical institutions have really matured, I think, significantly. And, um, you know, the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard, Baylor, um, they've, um, uh, I think that, the, I, I hope, and in my sense from talking to, to, your, to your senior officials is that these are partnerships that you really do value and you see them as, as ones that have helped to create Botswana capacity and, and that these are things that you hope will continue into the future. And I'd like you to just comment on that. Is that an accurate estimation? Because, you know, Building these kind of linkages between uh, forward-looking uh, African partner states like Botswana with American institutions of that kind, Baylor, University of Pennsylvania, Harvard, that's terribly important over the long term for the American people's understanding of what is possible and for building the constituency within our own society for a very forward-looking engagement. And could you comment at all on that? Certainly. Certainly with uh with all this, we, we, we see them as long-term arrangements. Long-term relationships between us and, 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 and these institutions, these medical schools. As you know, in the case of Harvard, we built the laboratories, we built the laboratories and they operate them because they have the technical know-how and the wherewithal, they equip and, and operate them. And research, by, because they are doing research on, on, on the virus, and this is a long-term thing, by, by definition. So it's a long-term relationship. The same thing with, uh, with, um, with, with Penn State. They are helping us establish a medical school. We don't expect the medical school to be established overnight. In the next two, three years, I need to be a proper medical school. Uh, uh, the study of medicine is, is a long-term, it's a long course, and therefore we expect uh, a long relationship. May I just for clarify, is it the University of Pennsylvania or is it Penn State? Go on, sorry, sorry. University of Pennsylvania. It's University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Sorry. It, it makes a big difference on football as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are beginning to play a number of your, your, your games. I don't know whether it's because of this. Uh, don't, don't ask the Penn Medical School to help with your football team. No, no. <laughs> But uh, I, I, I don't think football we would, when it comes to football, you see, when we say football, we mean soccer. Yes. And therefore, we will copy everything except football because we think it's misnamed anyway. <laughs> uh, it's misnamed rugby. And we're not that strong. <laughs> but no, the, the short answer is that we see uh, our relationship with uh, these institutions. Some of them may have been born out of the AIDS tragedy, but then AIDS itself is a long haul. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore, we see all these relationships as long-term long relationships between us and them, and that we will continue to need their endorsement, their assistance, and their expertise for a long time. Great, thank you. And that's much. why whenever I speak here, as I'm speaking to you, I say I thank you very much, and everything I have said, I hope it continues. Well, I think, you know, from the American standpoint, th these relationships, these partnerships transform our institutions in very positive ways. I mean, when you talk to people from each of those three institutions, it's changed their perspective, it's changed their outlook, uh, there's enormous excitement, uh, and uh, there are clear, clearly very long-term benefits for our society and our institutions for these partnerships, and we're very grateful for that. Let's get... Uh, a, a final closing round. We have three hands over there, so let's start with those. And we have one and a, a, a gentleman on the rear wall. Let's start. Yes, please. Please identify yourself and then offer your comment. Hazel Denton, Johns Hopkins University. I was very interested in hearing about the new medical school, and I'd like to ask a follow-up question. 
this is surely a very significant investment for Botswana. One of the problems faced by countries in Africa, though, is the emigration of its trained medical personnel. What will be the policies of Botswana to curb that with the newly trained people? Great, thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. Yes, ma'am. I'm Mia Milan. I'm a South African journalist that specializes in reporting on the HIV pandemic. But I also work for a media organization called Internews Network that helps journalists to report better on the HIV epidemic. And I was wondering how the president feels of if the media would be an important partner, the news media, journalists specifically, in the future efforts on HIV prevention in Botswana. And are you satisfied with the way that journalists report on the epidemic in your country? Great. Thank you very much. There's a third hand. Lindsay Freeman, Women's Edge Coalition. Mr. President, thank you for your inspiring and motivating comments, specifically on AGOA. My question is, could you speak to some of your ideas on the best ways to spark regional trade between sub-Saharan African countries, and then how the U.S. could be helpful in these efforts? Great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the, question, the question is, what, what can be done to promote uh, intra-regional trade within Southern Africa, and how can the U.S. be helpful in that regard? Yeah, hi. Uh, Darren over here. Darren Taylor from uh, VOA, English to Africa Service. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to know uh, what Botswana's position is on uh, AFRICOM, the uh, new um, plans by the U.S. To, uh, to establish a military base in Africa. And I'm asking this question in the light of the apparent SADC position that it's not welcome um, and your, uh, your government's good relations with the U.S. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, just to clarify on that closing question, there was a statement made by the South African Defense Minister, Tara Lakota, after the SADC ministerial and heads of state summit, uh, making the claim that uh, at least the defense chiefs within SADC member states had come to a consensus that they opposed the pla not they opposed the placement of a headquarters element on the continent. Uh, that and that was detailed in one, a press debrief that the minister, South African minister, provided afterward. There's been quite a bit of debate around what is the position of SADC actually on this matter of Africa. Mm -hmm. Mr. President? Well, thank you very much. Well, the, the loss of uh, medical skills is something that worries us. We have lost 100 doctors to the Republic of Ireland, and uh, we have lost uh, doctors uh, to Britain and a few to this country. So, in fact, the, the building of a, a medical school is part of the uh, effort to retain our, our doctors. Because most of the doctors who we, who we have lost uh, people who trained here, uh, then not going back home. People training in Ireland, and then they disappear into the country uh, to do internship, and then they, they refuse to, 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 to come home. So we hope that if the students train in Botswana, they, we know it for a certain that they will have difficulty trying to locate here as medical doctors, uh, although some of the best, you will still be able to pinch them because we notice that you are pinching a lot from the South African ones. <laughs> but normally, you pinch very well established ones. And they, they normally go to Texas and so on. I mean, it's white South Africans. So we are aware we can't stop it entirely. And constitutionally, basically, we can't do anything. We try to, we try to contact these students that they have to, we, we, we pay for their education. They should come and work in Botswana for five years of, for the length, for a period e equivalent to the length of their training. And that's what they are not, they are not doing. So we think that the, the establishment of the medical school and the students studying there in local conditions and being helped by by universities like uh, like Penn State and uh, even John Hopkins and others 
would, uh, well, what, whatever, well, <laughs> would, uh, would help uh, induce the students to, to stay at home uh, in doing all the nurses. But it's also cheaper. We found that uh, to train a, a, a student here, I think it costs about $100,000 a year, all in all. And it costs $40,000 in the rest of Africa, and um, 10000 10 to 20000 in in Botswana. So amongst other things, it's cheaper when we, when, when we train them at home. Uh, but also we think that they would be more acclimatized to conditions in Botswana. We also send students now to, to other African countries, especially Ghana. Uh, we know they will come back home, and they do. Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we have discontinued, we have discontinued sending medical students to here. Only those who are already here, of course, we, we will, they will finish and then, then, then they will go back home. Uh, well, we hope. But no, no new students, no new medical students will, will be sent here. We send them to the Caribbean, for instance, Trinidad and Tobago and uh, Jamaica. Uh, uh, and so on. Those, those, those come home. Now, together with the new arrangement that they will finish their courses but go and, and do their internship at home, by arrangement with, you know, with the medical schools with, from which they would have trained. Yeah, I think the media, I mean, the media is always an important partner in, in doing anything. And the media can help a lot. In Botswana, they have not been, been very enthusiastic about HIV AIDS. They, they used to write silly stories they, uh, and so on. Really, they have not come in strongly to, to help and to warn. We, we, we often have to pay uh, for advertisements, expensive advertisements. You know, on, 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 on AIDS with the media. In, in Botswana, the media, disappointingly, is not, is not coming forth, is not forthcoming in helping us sell the, the messages against HIV AIDS. But we will continue to try and persuade them. Uh, what can be done to promote regional trade in, in, in Southern Africa? Can the U U.S. help I don't know. I, I, I don't, wouldn't we be asking the United States too much if when we are sitting back there in, 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 in Southern Africa, now we say, you know, the United States must come make us talk to each other. Mm. That's, uh, that's asking too much for friends. I, I think to, to a very great extent, trade is already taking place. The problem is the imbalances in, the, in, in development between South Africa and the rest. Uh, so that uh, most countries source their, uh, many countries source their uh, imports from South Africa. Um, so we, and also re-exports by South Africa. Uh, if you take motor vehicles, we use a lot of Japanese and uh, German uh, and American vehicles, but they are assembled in South Africa. Uh, so, so the trade figures between us and, and, for instance, the United States, it's distorted by the fact that we consume American products via South Africa. The in the customs uh, arrangements documentation, they will come in as South African goods because they are being re-exported from South Africa. The South African companies that have invested have invested in South Africa. I mean, American companies that have invested in Southern Africa have invested in South Africa. Uh, and therefore, 
As for Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, and Namibia, we have always traded with South Africa. And now, of course, we are selling some of the things to South Africa. Uh, the rest of the region is beginning to trade and is, is uh, uh, selling things to South Africa, but mostly buying goods and services from South Africa. So I, I, I think regional trade is already taking place. AFRICOM, AFRICOM is a more controversial one. Defense chiefs have said so, led by South Africa. At the level of, of heads of state, we have said that we should continue to engage the American government uh, on this thing as to what exactly what it is and, and, and so on. Now, we have said that we will maintain an open mind until we know exactly the nature of the thing. But we will, of course, have to engage in the region too uh, because people simply say, we want a military base. And uh, the American government said not necessarily. And so as far as we are concerned for now, we are still open-minded to discuss with both the Americans and the region. We have no ideological objection to, to involvement with Americans. I mean, even as the Minister of, of Defense of South Africa was making the statement, they were having joint maneuvers with the American Navy in Cape Town. Uh, some of us have no navies, of course. And we know that you have spy satellites in, in there. <laughs> so we will ask both you and the South Africans why you want to cooperate there bilaterally by yourselves and you don't want, they don't want this particular one. So that's, that's our position. Our position is that we have not taken a, a decision on that. Majesty. And we are aware of the position of, of, of the defense chiefs in the region. We will engage them. And we will engage the authorities here who have now not fully explained the exact nature of, 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 of the arrangement. Yes. You've, you've got the special experience that um, you've hosted and been a partner in the creation of ILEA, of the, of the police training facility yes. um, down um, uh, near Lobazi, um, which has been in existence now for seven or eight years and has been, as I, as I understand, has been fairly successful. And that, yes. um, that's been a very good initiative um, that has had very broad continental benefits in terms of its its mandate is really to train, to, to help train police across the Africa, Africa continent. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? How that experience has been? Yeah, well, we accepted that we saw it as very useful from day one, and we have changed our views. We think what has happened is that the other people have seen how useful it is. Mm -hmm. uh, those who had uh, reservations, if they, if they did have them. Uh, uh, many, many countries are participating in the, in the thing. I understand they are saying that the ILEA, the uh, law enforcement agency, is, is building the capacity our capacity as African states to fight crime. Mm -hmm. They say that's different from a military base, if this thing is going to be a military base. They say the military base, then you can invade us, I suppose. Right. So there is a difference between ILEA sure. and uh, sure. the military arrangement. That's why I say we will have to know in some detail the nature of the arrangement and uh, therefore that will enable us to meaningfully engage yes. in knowing what you are talking about because terms like military base uh, and so on is uh, to some extent emotive and may have unsavory connotations. Uh, 
that um, the position of Botswana is that we're open-minded on this issue. Great. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Uh, Mr. President, this has really been an extraordinary conversation with you here, um, your speech and your openness to engage on this broad range of issues. And just on behalf of everyone here, I want to thank you for this, and uh, we look forward to continuing to engage, and uh, we wish you the best for the balance of your visit here and the balance of your tenure as President. So thank you so much.